What's well, up? Hello. Okay. Clara is here in the house. Wonderful. Uh, so what we're going to do is that we have a number of questions that people have pre-posted, pre-sent us through various channels. And also Tara is here live to ask us questions. And so, so is Sanders. Sander and Antonio. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so let's let's uh, let's wait a couple of minutes before uh, we get um, into uh, the the core questions that the attendees have uh, sent us. Uh, so, but uh, to to you know spend some time, let's kick it off by me asking you guys, who do you think is doing messaging really well? Which B two B company stands out for you? I'm biased, but I always feel like Intercom does it pretty well. Um, I used to work there and I know their kind of process or at least what their process used to be. And I've been impressed with them recently coming out with things faster, um, especially like how they responded to some of this chat GPT stuff. But I feel like they do a good job of n definitely getting people's interest, but not overselling, not overhyping and being really clear. Um, yeah, so I think Intercom does well. I have to think about that. We didn't. I didn't prepare for that question. Ariel, over to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Intercom is always like the example I look to for Inspo. Um, I think Momentum does messaging really well. Um, I also think Airtable does messaging really well. Um, I like how they speak to different personas on their website. It's clear. Um, yeah, those are two that come to mind. Plenty. There's plenty of companies that do it like pretty consistently. But yeah. So two. I see in the comments here, Loom, uh, Ankita likes lavender. So I think uh, there's, uh, uh, and she likes lavender's content. Okay. So where does messaging end and content marketing start? Where's the, where's the line here? That's a question. Go yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about that one. Okay. Um, the way I think about it is your tree. Like if you think of a tree, your roots are your positioning, your trunk is your messaging and the content is the branches and the leaves. So content starts with like themes or topics you want to speak to or talk about or build thought leadership on but your messaging is the kind of the the trunk of what how you show up and present yourself to the world. That's what I think about it. Yeah, and for me, it's like content really needs to be informed on like who your target audience is and what are yeah what are the key topics that you want want to have a point of view on. And so, you know, like I'm sure most companies right now they're like, okay, what we need to have a point of view on AI that needs to be clear in our positioning and our messaging. And then that's going to get brought up in all these content pieces, all these blog pieces, all these LinkedIn posts. Um, but yeah, I always try to frame it as like, what do you need to have a unique point of view on that's fleshed out so that that comes through in your content? And then, I mean, it's, it's not messaging, it's more positioning, but I fall into this trap myself. Um, sometimes like certain topics are really easy to create content about, but they're not necessarily <laughs> the target audience that you want to be writing for. For example, I find it really easy to write content for early, like early career product marketers, harder to make meaningful, valuable content for CMOs. But like, that's kind of who I want to be, you know, attracting with my, with my business and stuff. And so it can just like the messaging, you got to come back to your messaging pillars and be like, who am I supposed to be writing for? What am I supposed to be writing about? Because some topics are easier than others. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So messaging is not about the website, right? Messaging is just what do we, what is the story we want to tell to the market? What are the three ideas, three to five, whatever number of ideas we want the market to know about us? And content marketing then is using a number of channels to get the same messages out there. So whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, or your website, the message should stay the same. Uh, okay, so we have a number of people here live with us. 
So how this is going to go is that, guys, I would ask you to please post questions in the chat here, and we will talk about these questions. Uh, while you're thinking about your questions and writing them up, we're going to start taking questions that some of you have pre-sent us when we were first promoting this AMA session. Uh, so uh, we have a question uh, that is called, uh, that is, uh, PMMs spend a lot of time crafting and aligning on messaging, but it's all a waste if sales doesn't actually use it. Any ideas on keeping sales invested and actually start using it? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. So first of all, don't ever try to engage with a sales team at the end of their quota, like the end of their month, at the end of their cycle. They Their hair is on fire. They are trying to close their deals and make their, make their quota. So don't ever talk to them. Uh, wait till the beginning of the cycle. That's always kind of my recommendation. They're starting to think about, okay, what changes am I making to my approach? How am I building out my pipeline? Um, and then I always recommend uh, going to their sales calls and not just a couple. Um, and, you know, I know it's hard in this remote world, but I also think, yeah, you can listen to gong calls after the fact, but just like being there and with them to like build trust and like let them know that you're kind of in the trenches with them. Um, but listening to sales calls, like, what are prospects asking? Where are things getting tripped up? Because if you're just relying on hearing from your sales team, like if they're like, oh, I need a battle card on this or I need this, they they might not quite realize like what you can bring to the table. And so you need to understand what like the root cause is or what the root need is, not necessarily like, what people are asking for. Um, and so I always recommend going to these calls with them and you have to go to like a lot. It's not it's like dating. You can't just go to one sales call and then like expect to have this crazy epiphany, just like you can't go on one date and be like, okay, I'm at the love of my life. I'm getting married. So you got to go to a lot of them. Um, Cause I've seen a lot of PMS. I'm like, you should have sat on our sales calls. And they're like, yeah, I went to like one or two, but it wasn't useful. I'm like, well, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta do a little bit um, quantity there. And then yeah, listen to what they're asking for and try to understand what they actually need rather than just knee jerk reaction to what they say they need. Can I add one thing? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the other quick thing is in order to get, I mean, you need to get alignment with the sales team from the beginning. Uh, and so if they're, they need to be invested in it and feel like this, you know, they agree with it, that they contribute to it. So whether that are working on the positioning and messaging through workshops or whatever it is, um, whether you're bringing in however many people from sales or VP of sales or whatever, it's including them in the messaging development process. Uh, so they feel like, yeah, we're not, they're not just being handed something. Um, there was internal alignment driven before, like output of sales development and stuff like that. Yeah, you can usually tell who is kind of more innovative, like type of salesperson. There's some kind of people that like follow a certain book and then other people who are more comfortable with experimenting. So I always try to figure out who that person is. It's usually very obvious, like who they are. Um, and then I also try to just be really realistic about what they will and won't care about. So like, for example, I've been on teams where we're launching a product and it's going to be free for six months. Sales team doesn't care because that doesn't help them close their quotas. So like you can send them as many decks as messaging guides or, you know, battle cards as you want, but they're just not going to prioritize it because it's not going to help them close like convert their pipeline. So you just have to be realistic too about like, just because it's your most exciting new feature, doesn't mean that it's most exciting to them. Thank you. Uh, let's take a question from the audience here live. So Ankita has posted a question about uh, customer journeys. How do you talk to customers to understand the customer journey? And what are the alternatives to this if this is not possible? So I'll, I'll start with the, with the second half of the question. What are the alternatives? So should you not be able to talk to people directly? And I'm going to make a case that you always can. Then, well, where are these people hanging out, right? Is there a Reddit sub, subreddit? Is there a Facebook group? Is there a, you know, a Slack group? Is there a community? You can tap into it, just listen to what they're talking about. How are they, the words they are using to describe the issues? Is there an ongoing discussion? It's not available for every single type of customer you're after, but a lot of them. So that, that's one option. Second option is you use, uh, de depending who you're after, if it's a, a consumer product, uh, it's really easy to tap into various consumers using um, 
<clears throat> all kinds of consumer survey platforms out there. There's like a hundred of them. If it's B2B, you can use winter buyer intelligence surveys to survey a type of uh, person with by title industry, et cetera, et cetera. But let's say we get the customer on, the, on a Zoom call with us. Then uh, what do you guys like to ask them to understand their journey? I don't know if I have a good answer for this one. Ariel, do you want to try? Um, I think it's really just about understanding like back to basics, like what's the problem? When did you recognize you had it? What have you tried to do to solve it? What was it like trying to find solutions to your problem? Have you tried other things? Um, and then what brought you to this product or what we're selling? Like, who did you speak to? Um, what are you considering? Is there anything that help, is it gonna help you make a decision? So just some of these like basic questions can help you understand number one, like what they've, like what their journey has actually looked like or what you might be able to create to further, to progress the journey um, to get them to buy. Which is some, Simple yeah, you yeah. can use various uh, jobs to be done type of um, interview templates, as in like what yeah. happened in your life when this issue came up, like, you know, mm -hmm. I was walking my dog and then the dog shut on the, you know, on the road and then, oh, that's when I realized I need the gloves. Uh, yeah. you know, or, <laughs> yeah. or also like you want to use what uh, you want to understand what did they use as an alternative. So if you don't buy us, what do you mm -hmm. do instead to understand where their mm -hmm. mind goes? Um, okay, uh, let's 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 take a next question because there's uh, there's more coming up here. So Tara is asking, in your experience, how do you align with the brand marketing team? PMMs are more focused on the product, but sometimes the messaging can overlap, especially when the main business is tech. We seem to align, but I, I am interested to know any other experience. Yeah, for me, especially in the early stage, it's probably going to be more product led messaging. Um, you know, I think as a consumer, you know, and I think marketers, we, lo we love to talk about like, what's your why and, and being like really mission oriented. But I, I just think that that's hard to do. Um, uh, one, like, I don't think buyers necessarily care that much, um, especially if you're selling like live chat or like email. It's like, okay, <laughs> not every SaaS product is changing the world. Not every email marketing tool is like, you know, sometimes it's just an email marketing tool and that's okay. Um, and I just don't think, I think it's too far removed to be like, oh, we're making the world a better place by, you know, making your work faster so you can get home to your, I don't know. I just like, that's just like a little wishy-washy. And so I think for most for most companies, it should be product first messaging. And then that brand story can come through, you know, in your about page and and you know, in the interviews with the founder or like a keynote talk or whatever. But like I think for most part, your website should be down to brass tacks, product differentiated, value props, and save the kind of brand messaging for the podcast guesting and you know the about page um that's just me I, and i think yeah i think bigger companies they tend to lean more into brand like you see you see like uber billboards or whatever and it's like moving people and you know that wouldn't have worked for them early days they just needed to be very clear about what they did so i, I tend to lean away from brand messaging as much unless you really are actually like a climate tech like, you know, saving puppies kind of business. But what do you think, Eric? Yeah, I have to agree. No, I have to agree. Um, I've only really, I think companies that actually have brand marketing teams, it, at least if they're B2B SaaS, they're usually much bigger, larger established companies where the brand marketing team is kind of doing something a little bit different than products. Um, I'm not too sure, maybe it's different with B2C. I'm more in B2B. Um, yeah, just, I agree with Ray. Um, I think they're synergistic, but product is more focused on like, yeah, what does this do for you? Um, and brand and like the feeling and the aspirations maybe become a little bit more important later. 
Yeah. I think Patagonia does brand and product really well together. That company is incredible mm -hmm. at that. But again, you know, they've, they really have been able to tie their audience and their products to like, you know, being more um, earth friendly. And so, yeah, not mm -hmm. a number one strategy for me personally, but. So aligning my sense would also be that good old autocracy and dictatorship solves a lot of problems. So if there's a brand team, there's a product marketing team, they report to somebody, there's a queen B. Go to queen hey i want to say this they want to say that queen says how it's going to be and then everybody will follow the book i mean <laughs> if we can't agree on stuff somebody needs to decide and then we you know disagree and commit uh yes. Yes. next question alicia is asking when asking questions on sales calls how do i justify asking prospects questions that are about their general challenges and goals, which are not directly related to the product, but are important for marketers to get a 360 degree understanding of what's important to the ICP, um, like what influencers they follow, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, I'll start here. So I'm, I'll, I do a lot of sales calls uh, every week. I'm, I'm, I'm in one. And the key thing about a sales call is that you do not even start pitching the pro product. You don't talk about your product on, until you diagnose and confirm. Diagnose what is the problem, uh, and how did you come up with you know about the problem you know with the, with the thing that's going on. Why did you schedule the meeting if it's inbound? You understand the background. You just ask questions, and people usually when they when you ask them questions, they talk, and if they don't want to answer, they'll make it clear, and then you confirm meaning that do i understand correctly that this is happening and this is the problem and this is you know what's what's going on and if they say no then you go back to diagnosing then you pitch so in in, in a normal sales call you know 70 percent of time should be spent in this phase i want to say uh that doesn't mean it's 45 minutes right because that's, that's usual usual um call is 30 minutes right in my case it's 20 minutes of chatting 10 minutes of showing product um yeah. do you guys have anything yeah i'm also i feel like maybe the alicia i don't know if you're in sales or in marketing but you might be kind of conflating a sales call with like a research call so for example asking what influencers they follow or like their sources of information. Like I would probably be not offended, but just like confused as to like why that was being asked in a sense. Like, I think it's just a slightly odd question to ask. I, I find though that prospects are love talking and they love talking about themselves. So it's more like more open-ended, like rather than being like, well, are you following, you know, who are you following more like, you know, like what is part of like helping you, what's helping you make this decision? Like what, what, um, you know, like what kind of things are important to you or like what's going on with this problem. And then people might mention, they're like, oh, well, I saw Pep talking about this thing or I saw like, but I just think it's like a little bit more of a market researchy question and that people so are survey your audience, right? Send the survey. Uh, yeah. Easier, less friction way. So I agree that, I agree with why they probably feel like it's not relevant because it's just like kind of an odd question to ask in a sales call. Mm -hmm. uh, Ariel, yeah. I have a next question for you. So Sander is saying, I get confused with the messaging position and content and copy. You mentioned the tree analogy. Are there other quick tips and tricks to remember what is what and how to explain it? Yes. Okay. So I think that I'm pulling this if I'm pulling this correctly from the course we did, but positioning is, um, here, I'm gonna mess this up. Positioning is where you are in the are in the market. Messaging is how you convey that and copy is the cleverness in how you say it. So again, uh, let me just reread this question. My take is positioning yeah, determines who you're for and what problem do you solve? Yes. And you hopefully in a differentiated way that doesn't sound like everybody else. And messaging is yeah. what are the some key ideas we want to communicate? What do we want them to know about us? 
and copy is the specific words you use to communicate those ideas. That's my thing. Yeah, you, and you, yeah, and you can think of positioning. Um, you know, if you go to look at someone's site, or you know, you're trying, you can't really see anyone's positioning. It's very hard for you to say this is this company's positioning. When looking at other companies' positioning, we're always kind of guessing based on the messaging we see on the website, based on who we interpret they're speaking to. Um, so positioning is kind of this, this the root of the tree. You don't see them. They're there. And the messaging is, okay, how are we communicating the problem to the persona? You know, what's clear about the value we're providing the problem we're solving? Uh, and copy is just, you know, the leaves of the tree. Like how, you know, we can be pithy, we can be clever. Um, but messaging is not about being pithy and clever. It's about being clear. So that's kind of a, how to think about them differently. You can't have copy that works and resonates if your positioning and messaging is not clear. Yeah. I always think of the, there's like an Air Asia billboard that I saw. And uh, you can imagine that like their positioning is like, you know, people in their 20s who want to travel to Asia. Their messaging point is like, you know, cheap flights to Asia. And then the billboard, like the copy said, cheap enough to say, fuck it, I'll go. But it's like P-H-U. It's like the name of a city yeah, in Thailand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like that is like clever copy. But like the messaging is probably just like cheap flights to 32 places in Asia. Like it's very boring. Exactly. And positioning is an internal document. Once it's on the website, it's not positioning. It's already basically copy. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, next question. Uh, let me see here. Some of these are like content marketing topics. Like Basim is asking about topic clusters and top of the funnel content. That's not messaging. Uh, so content marketing is, is a little different thing. So I'm going to just ignore that. Uh, but Sarah is asking here, Rachel, how do you sell the value of product marketing to CMOs? Good question. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I think for me, the, the angle is, you know, positioning and messaging impacts literally everything you do. You know, it's the story that comes up in your fundraising pitch deck. It shows up on your landing pages, shows up in your sales decks and um, at your, you know, live events that you're hosting. And so just such a fundamental part of your entire go to market strategy. It impacts, you know, the ads you run and your targeting. And so like, to me, you know, it's like building a house on sticks instead of like a concrete foundation. I do feel like CMOs for the most part get that. I mean, you know, there are a fair amount of CMOs who come from more like a communications, like PR type of side. Um, but even they, I feel like understand the like importance of positioning and messaging. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not that hard of a play. What I think is actually a harder play is to convince people that you're the right person to help them do that. Um, I, I think they know that it's important. It's just who and how are they going to do it? Um, you know, I, I see a lot of companies kind of reach out to these really sexy brand studios, who I feel like don't have a lot of skin in the game. They like, they kind of do this like big, beautiful presentation and then they're like, okay, bye. But they're not like in the trenches with you, like looking at conversions going up or down, down, downstream of the work. Um, yeah, that's kind of my take there. I feel like CMOs now. Yeah, Sarah Maybe is that I see working at Meta. So I can only imagine the complexity of that organization. Um, so I don't know anything about that. In a less complex organization, if I were you as a product market, I would try to own a metric that is um, that is just uniquely you, if you, if you can. <clears throat> it can be a, a blended metric, something like I think uh, Chris Walker Refine Labs uh, has like uh, website acceleration something formula. Uh, like it's a blend, uh, blended metric, or you can just own conversion rate, website conversion rate, because the most powerful part of the conversion rate is do people wanna want what you offer? Do they want to get a demo? Do they want to sign up for a trial? Right, and that's 
that's how you convey the value, which is the essence of product marketing. Okay, more questions. Let's uh, let's move on. So, uh, Guy is asking, I want to make SaaS sexy. What's the best way to do so? Hmm. I mean, I don't know if SaaS is sexy, but okay. Yeah, I think what, well, what I think is the problem, huh? <laughs> Pep's bringing sexy back. Uh, well, I think um, maybe this is a bit like controversial, but I think like sexy is maybe more about brand. I think strong positioning and messaging care about being sexy. It cares about being fair and speaking to pain points. Um, Sexiness is maybe more of a brand thing, depending on how you like to show up online. Yeah, more visuals. Yeah, yeah, more in your visual representation. I mean, it's also the fact that there is no best spaghetti sauce, right? You like one kind and I like another kind. So what is sexy needs to align with our worldview. And those can be, is, is Fox News sexy? I mean, I, I bet it is for some people, right? And so yes. you need to appeal to a particular worldview. Uh, it's not like uniform. People are different. Um, yeah. When we when we work with a lot of developer, like developer tool type things, and like what developers are intrigued by and find sexy or like compelling, it's just like completely different from the type of things that I'm, you know, interested in. Like even my husband, who's a data scientist, we were looking at some website recently and he, I was like, just kind of scrolling. He was looking over my shoulder and he's like, oh, it does that? Oh my God. He was like, and I was like, what? I, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's really about knowing your audience and trying mm -hmm. to really understand that, what them up at night. Let's, let's the other take a more specific like question. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. Let's take a more specific question that is better to answer. So, uh, Vaishnavi is asking, as a PMM, how can I crack the messaging for my product if we solve for three different personas? And what matters to uh, customer success does not matter to customer education. So what do you do in that circumstance? Go for it, Ariel. Yeah, well, yeah. So if you, if you, if you take the B2B messaging course, um, we talk a lot about personas, which you're mentioning here. And then, you know, the pre the pre you prioritize right they need to be you know are you going to make marketing product and sales decisions around these and if you are and you're going to speak to these people differently like you're saying customer success customer education care about different things well um i think loom is a great example if you go to their website or Airtable as well all these different kind of types of Asana. companies they have sauna they all have landing they all have pages that speak Right, the product's the same, but they have pages that speak directly to these personas and how these personas would use the product, which is different, right? Like a developer or data scientist would use the product differently than a marketer, even though it's fundamentally the same product. So you could think about on your website, you know, you have your homepage or whatever that talks high level of like the product or platform. And then you could have like use cases. That's one use cases for customer success, one use cases for customer education. You can speak more direct directly to those jobs or get granular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to know, like, is this for me? Am I in the right place? Like when I got to this website, I don't want to be doing any mental gymnastics to imagine how I would use this product. Like, you know, I understand, you know, I'm a smart person. I can read, I can understand like, you know, the building blocks or something. I think Zapier is a good example of like, it's a very powerful product. I understand there's like integrations and tools and stuff, but it can be very overwhelming to like imagine how you would use it. And so I think Zapier really has to get their personas and their segmentation right, because like as a marketer, I'm gonna use Zapier completely differently as someone else would. And so just like not making them interpret or guess how they would use their product, use your product and kind of speaking like, so even though for Asana, the pain point is like be organized and save time. You know, the way I'm using it is like for a product launch or, you know, getting my content calendar like tightened up, those types of things. So, yeah, making sure I'm in the right place and I don't have to like do any mental gymnastics to imagine how I would use your product. And self segmentation. So, if you have multiple personas, have them self segment, go down a different rabbit hole, uh, things like that. 
All right. Uh, next question here. Dor is asking, how will messaging be different for new versus existing markets? Where should the focus be for each? So I'm guessing the the idea here is that uh, they have an existing core group of customers and now they want to expand to a new persona. Oh, I see. I see. That's my interpretation anyway. I mean, my knee jerk reaction to that was like, there aren't really a lot of new markets. Like anytime I hear someone talking about like category creation, I'm like, mm, are you like creating a new category? Or are you just really positioning yourself in a different way? But uh, yeah, if you're expanding to new markets, I mean, probably it depends on how familiar they are, but it's probably gonna be a lot more education. Um, I'll use Asana as another example, like they went public and I've been kind of watching them and pretty much you know, with our clients, like every marketing team we, we work with uses Asana, but every dev team doesn't. And so like, you know, I think like, is Asana ever going to like try to tap the developer market or is that always going to be like in Jira? And so, or, you know, Confluence or whatever other like project management tools, these other kind of markets are using. But then there's also like international market, like are we talking about geo markets? Like, okay, you've been dominating the US, now you want to expand to Latin America. You know, I think that's a very different play too. Like I know um, I was helping, we were helping a company called Ping Me. They, I think they renamed to Juni. Um, they, you know, really savvy in the finance space. We're building some financial tools for the African market. And like the entire brand was different. Like the messaging wasn't that different, but like, you know, in, in US markets, like we love blue and like for tech and green and like those, the blue feels like trustworthy and stuff. But, but I guess blue to like an African market is more like a funeral <laughs> vibe. And so, you know, they liked things like purples and pinks and yellows. And so I, I don't know, like, it depends what market you're trying to expand to. Are you trying to expand to a different vertical within like the US tech market? Are you going international? Are you actually trying to create, like be a market maker? Like I think Uber was an actual market maker. Um, you know, the cab drivers were really mad that they were getting um, deals like customers were switching to Uber, but I never actually took yellow cabs in deep Soma in San Francisco before. So I, I would argue some companies are creating markets. I actually just to quickly add, simplify even more, I think it, it doesn't matter, right? The job story, like what they're trying to do, what problem they're trying to solve, whether it's a new market or not, is probably the same. As long as you identify the right, the correct job story, I don't think it matters if it's a new or existing market. Mm. There's a lively discussion about the metrics uh, PMM should own, you know, like can't own conversion rate because of it's too complex and more goes in there. My th thinking is yes, and it is complex, but if you, I think you go for a bullshit metric like win rates, it's even far more removed from from conversion rate like pmm who sends a deck to a salesperson who follows up 20 times seven months of pitching and you think pmm takes any credit ah please i i just do not agree and any polling also it's like so weak until pmms use weak metrics that are far removed from direct impact they're always gonna be deck monkeys and so pmms need to say fuck it i'm gonna own conversion rate and fuck you guys well, that's my personal point of view. Uh, Mickey Mouse metrics lead to Mickey Mouse power in an organization. Uh, yep, I agree. <laughs> I agree. It's the same thing of like, you know, ask, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Like, you know, it is hard, but I think PMMs need to take a note from growth marketers here and look at the entire funnel and try to own and try to take responsibility for those things and work with product and sales to, to really help yourself be accountable and take some skin in the game, like looking at, you know, not just conversions, but churns or whatever, uh, churn, you know, expansion. But yeah, I just feel like PMMs, like they like to be esoteric and I, you know, they like to be like, Oh, well, it's strategy. And, um, yeah, just like take a note from growth marketers and like, look at the funnel, try to like t tackle a metric, try to own a metric, try to improve the metric. And then you can like say, okay, now I'm going to focus on churn or now I'm going to focus on expansion, you know, some year later or whatever. But yeah, I agree with Pep, like put some skin in the game. 
There's yeah. a reason why Dimensions budget is, you know, a few, you know, zeros bigger than product marketing yeah. uh, ever is. Because uh, they know their metrics, right? And CMO knows, and when there's layoffs or budget increases, we know where the money goes and who's who's going to get laid off. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we need to redefine what a PMM is, right? Uh, so that's also like managing up, and I and it's it's definitely hard. Not saying it's easy. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, somebody asked a very practical question here. The practical question was. Uh, what methods do you recommend for transferring your messaging storylines to copywriters, social media folks, especially when they're outsourced? So basically, how do you convey what our messaging is to third party people? A messaging guide. Positioning and messaging guide. Um, Where does that live you know, and what does that look like? I mean, it can be different for, for different folks. You know, you can have it in a Google, a Google Doc, right? That's like a three four page document that's like, you know, this is our pitch, that our products benefits, our features, value props, uh, um, like key personas, you know, it doesn't need complicated. Um, and the other thing to think about too is just, um, at least with personas, right? We want something that's, you know, what are the key pain points, goals? What do they care about? How, do, how might they use the product in a high level, easy to digest way? Um, you can also convert that into like a, you know, a, a short slide deck that's visually designed that's even more easy to digest than like a guide that's three to four pages long um, that you can share with like copywriters, et cetera. Um, yeah. Yeah. For me, the key is the messaging guide has to be short. Like, yeah, four pages like tops and, you know, offer links for people to double click and be like, okay, really high level. These are the this is the pitch to the buyer, this is the pitch to the user, you know, but then like have them double click in if they want to learn more. But so many times, first of all, if you don't know what you're saying, you'll say a lot. And like a really long messaging guide isn't a messaging guide. That's just like, you know, a dictionary of all the things you might ever say ever. But it's like, no, <laughs> be really clear. Like these are the three, four points we're really trying to go after. These are the three, four personas we're really trying to go after. Don't be coming in here with 12 personas and like 16 point messaging guides. <laughs> like no one's going to follow it. No one's going to read it. So you got to be like really succinct. And then if people want to double click and read more, they can. Um, but yeah, my biggest problem is they're always like too long and wishy-washy. It's like, be clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, and at all of mine, we'll do like a persona, a persona's deck, which each persona gets one slide. But then we link to, hey, want to learn more? Click on the persona's report we did. That's sometimes like 25 pages. So, right, we, we start with high level. And if you want to learn more, sure, go here. There's a follow up question of like, uh, how do you ensure uptake, which I guess is like, uh, how do you ensure compliance? Well, I mean, if you outsource on a content piece to, you know, Vishnu from Upwork, do you just publish it without reading it? No, I mean, there's some Q&A, right? There's some back and forth, editorial process. So that should um, take care of it. I think it can be in your editorial checklist too. It's like, you know, when I'm reading a piece, I'm like, first of all, is it interesting? Because if it's boring, just get out. I don't care. Um, you know, is it clear who this is for? Is it clear, like, what is the clear value takeaway? you know, and how does this align to our bigger, like our bigger goals? Um, so I think that can be part of your editorial process, not just like, you know, grammar and typos and structure, but like strategy, like impact to the business. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, there's the a other related... Oh, go ahead. There's a related question that was sent uh, in advance to us which is what's the best way to make sure messaging stays consistent across all channels again that clear messaging guide like if there's 16 points in the messaging guide <laughs> everyone's going to pick one that they kind of like are you know are interested in or resonate or whatever so i think yeah bringing that clear messaging guide you could do some audits you could be like you know as a leader maybe I'm not reading every blog post that goes out the door or I'm not approving every copy for LinkedIn that goes out the door, but could do like a, an audit occasionally, which is like, Hey, you know, this is speaking to this buyer persona, but we're trying to focus on this one. Or, you know, I'm not really sure this, this messaging seems to be convoluted or it's not leading with pain points. Um, but I also feel like there's some, I don't know, 
some companies I think are too, they're so tight on it that they can't like ship and publish and iterate and like test. So you kind of got to get, like, I know Pep, you're posting like a ton of great content, like memes, like, you know, some of these memes that like really pop and like get you, you noticed, are they like necessarily tying to like your messaging guide? Not necessarily. Well, I'm a personality. I'm not, a, you know, the corporate brand. It's aligned, but it's not, I post shit that I wouldn't post under the company. <clears throat> yeah, of course. Yeah. I think the crux uh, of this is like, I mean, you don't want to be micromanaging people of like, are you adhering to this specifically? But the, the crux of it is when you're rolling out new messaging, you're sharing a guide, whatever it is, the process of getting to that guide, like we're the right people and leaders involved in developing that messaging, because if they are, they're going to help you ensure that everyone in the company understands why this is important. Everyone understands, you know, where this doc lives. Everyone understands how we're going to start applying this across channels. And so it's less of an enforcing thing and it's more from bottoms up where people are already bought in and it's less of an issue of like, are you adhering and using it correctly? Also, sometimes like product marketing or even like marketing leaders or they like to like drink their own Kool-Aid and they just think that like, you know, this messaging is incredible. But if you find yourself like people not sticking to it, like I've seen a lot of PMMs get like mad at sales for like switching the deck around and it's like, right. But it's their quota. Like they're trying to close. Like they, they, you know, if people are not following your messaging, maybe figure out why maybe they don't think it's good. Maybe it's not resonating. You know, that yeah, might maybe be a sales found a message that works better. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a spicy question sent by Jeff. Uh, oh, I love spicy questions. What should you do when a competitor with more reach steals your messaging deliberately or, you know, by accident? So, you know, we, we talk about differentiation and, oh, you know, tech is a, you know, it's a commodity. Everybody can copy every feature. Well, copying every word is even easier. You know, I can do it. I can copy your messaging in the next two minutes. So what do you do when that happens, especially if it's a more powerful competitor? I've had uh, my I, words copied, stolen, used so many times. You just got to, some of it more blatant than others. But I mean, yeah, you just got to stay in front of it. You got to just like keep, keep being better. Um, I do think like punching up is different than punching down per se, but I think everyone's understanding of what is punching up and down might be different. Like I still think of myself as like running a small agency, but maybe other people see all of mine as like a bigger fish. I actually don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Ariel, do you have a good example? Good answer. I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I've seen this, I've seen this happen with like clients I've worked with. Um, and then, at least in my personal experience is we're constantly oh you copied us okay what's our next thing like what is an even better message or even a more forward type of um north star for us how can we work we're typically the the bigger fish is a bigger company makes them a bit slower not always but tip some often and so if you're the small fish the newer player you can more quickly iterate and so it's really just yeah constantly oh they copied us let's switch it up what can we add yeah. what can we that's what I've seen. Oh, yeah. I can add to like then products. The oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, and I was just saying, and then they're playing catch up. So, yeah. It also comes down to product. Like, you got to find if your product's not differentiated, like, you're constantly going to be in this copycat game. Like, you know, um, but like when I was at Intercom, we were launching like the operator bot that lives in the messenger. Um, this was years ago, like 2000, I don't know. 17 or something. And Zendesk was definitely the incumbent on the customer support side. They pre-announced a bot. Like we were first to actual product mark, like actually to the market, but they were first to announce. Um, and you have to find the story only you could tell. So like at Intercom, we were kind of punching up at Zendesk because everything that they did, their entire product ethos was built around tickets. And it's like you were you reach out to support and you're like, thanks for your, you know, your question, your ticket number, sixty seven thousand million, whatever. And so, like, sure, they could try to copy this feature or that feature, but fundamentally they were built on tickets. And so that was kind of our angle. So I, I think you just like got to go deeper 
and figure out how you're differentiated on product. Exactly. I think like if you're just a commodity type of provider where it's so easy to say that you also do these things and it's going to happen to you forever. Right. And if you're a smaller brand, um, which means that you're a challenger, you need to take an edgier position. Uh, you can have an edgier worldview that is too risky for the bigger incumbent to copy because they will be risk averse. So if, if the competition is telling the same story that, uh, or if the, whatever story your competition is telling and it's working, then you can't tell the same story to the same people, even if you tell it louder or with more style. And so you can find success by telling a different story to uh, a, part, a part of that community that has a particular maybe worldview that's different from the, um, you know, it's the Zendesk tickets versus, uh, I don't know what the intercom said, but that's a worldview difference, right? Um, so find the worldview, which is you know, it's not easy to do, but if, 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 if you're edgier, then they just can't copy you. Yeah. Um, another question here is everyone knows that you can't build messaging without vetting it with your customer first. So, but how do you achieve that at scale and in a way that isn't just an echo chamber, echo chamber for what they think you want to hear? So this is about messaging research, I guess. So uh, I'm researching my ICPs, uh, and how how do I use my research data to inform my messaging? Should I pander, you know, preach to the choir? Do you want to take that Ariel, or I can go? Yeah, I think, well, number one, oh, do I have Sorry. a lag? I think I've okay. got lag. You go, you go. Okay, well, first of all, I mean, I think Winter's a great kind of product for this. You know, you can come up with your, through your research, through, you know, the stuff you've done, you can present your, you know, initial V1 messaging, what you think is going to work to an audience on Winter and then see, like, what's clear, what's not. Um, the other thing you can do is, yeah, just putting it live, right, on your website and uh, testing it out for a bit, right? Everything, positioning and messaging is constant iteration. It's never done. So everything's an experiment, putting it out there, seeing what resonates. You know, if you have some customers that, you know, have been with you for a long time that, you know, really love your product, that you consider friendlies, you know, you could send, you know, your, your new messaging to them and say, hey, like, does this land, does this speak to why you worked with us from the start, you know, why you continue to stay with us, what, you know, and just get some feedback from some customers you trust. Um, those are just a few things you can do. Yeah, I like involving my, I like being a little more gorilla about things sometimes. Like it's not always like a, you know, a great designed survey monkey, you know, properly done thing. Like I just like to like hit up people in my network, friends, or just like, you know, acquaintances who I feel like have a strong point of view on this particular like area or whatever. And I'm just like, hey, like, please tell me what you think and lay it on thick. And like just inviting people like in an authentic way to be like, hey, please shoot this down now. Like, please shit on this now so that when it's like bigger, like live in a bigger way, you know, it, it can su be successful and like, Sometimes just the way you ask, like, hey, how could this be 10 times better? Because sometimes people look at stuff and they're like, yeah, yeah, fine. Like, we all just kind of like move on with our, our day and our life. So could be kind of just guerrilla style asking people. And then sometimes it's like things are said in passing that you you weren't necessarily doing proper research. But like, um, you know, one person was like, apparently had looked at the Olivine website once and they're like, oh, it seems like you do more like, um, go to market and like less positioning and messaging. I was like, oh, that's super interesting. Cause like we start every engagement with positioning and messaging. And like, sometimes you just need like a fresh person's perspective to just like tell you honestly. So yeah, I think in a lot of ways, it's just how you ask. Yeah. A uh, similar question here. Um, when even your CEO says you're selling a commodity, how do you think about messaging something different from your competitors? So if you actually are a commodity, we also do email marketing, then what? And you need to be differentiated. What do you do? 
I mean, you're going to have to stand out and differentiate somehow, either with price, like quality of customer service, speed, quality, preferably all four. You know, you can think about like a lot of consumer brands that are commodities like Domino's. Don't they, aren't they the ones that did like the pizza in 30 minutes or less thing? Like, I, you know, I, I think like looking at commodity examples, I like to look at bikes a lot, it's bicycles. There's like a million different types of bicycles. There's a million different types of cars, but they all do kind of have their little spot in their, like their slot in there. Yeah. Um, so for instance, Trek, what they did was they, they also have a, a, a racing bike. You know, I think in, in, uh, Lance Armstrong, I think was riding a Trek in Tour de France. Uh, and so now they're, they're selling Trek through like we're a racing bike, but you, you know, can also ride a Trek bike. I mean, it's not an expensive bike, you know, it's, a, it's an average bike. Uh, and Liquid Death, yeah, Sandra, that's a great yes. example of selling a commodity product. Yeah. And it's pure branding, you know, uh, difference, right? There's no yeah. factual difference to the product. That's how I feel about my Brompton. I have a folding bike. I bring it, like, I've traveled all around the world with it. And, like, there's tons of folding bikes, but the Brompton uh, company, they, they just have this, like, kind of British look about them. And every year they have a race where everyone, like, wears, like, business, like, suits and, like, you know, office wear. And they, like, race. And then at the end they have martinis. And it's, like, all folding bags are the same, but whatever reason, I'm just like totally into this Brompton look. And I'm doing like someday I hope to go to this Brompton race and wear like mm -hmm. a suit and drink a martini. <laughs> so I don't know. That could be how you engage with your community as well, like more audience engagement. Next question is How would you recommend product uh, marketing managers improve their messaging skills? Why not get better at messaging? What, where, do you, where do you start? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this free course we made. Should be a good fit. It's, yeah, it's free, free after all. Nothing to lose. Yeah. It's free. Uh, are there ways to test messaging without spending a dollar? Uh, well, Winter has a free feature where you bring when you bring your own audience. You have you have people to invite to your message test. It's completely free. Uh, so that that's one way. Um, if you have friends, that's another way. What else comes to mind? I like posting things on like channels where I'm a little more anonymous, like Reddit. Um, and sometimes you get some real feedback that way. Um, like my husband's a data scientist. He was building this patent analyzer tool and we posted it in a subreddit for like patent examiners. And I mean, oh my God, it was the most humbling. <laughs> so humbling. They just like shitting on it. <laughs> You're like, okay, I need a cigarette. But yes, that was helpful. <laughs> So sometimes mm -hmm. being more anonymous, like, cause I feel like if I post on LinkedIn, I have like a bit of a following there. People will be really nice to me. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, next question here uh, is about brand purpose. So if I come up with a brand purpose, should that be my North star for messaging? You know, so, uh, if, yeah, go ahead. My take is, brand purpose, um, like brand messaging, brand purpose, values and mission. Um, it, it's useful, but it's separate from product marketing. It's separate from messaging and positioning. I mean, obviously your, your mission, your brand purpose, you can think of it as like a kind of North star, but especially for earlier stage companies, like you, you want to, um, you really want to be focusing on like, product positioning and messaging. So brand pur pur purpose can be this kind of hot, you know, thing you're working towards. And a brand purpose, by the way, should be me measurable and accomplishable. That accomplishable is the word. So like, can, you know, we'll, how will you know when you've hit, when you've accomplished your mission? Um, and that can kind of be like the pinnacle or North Star for, you know, specific positioning and messaging. Um, but it, it, yeah. It is, at least in the beginning, it can be it's still separate, right? You really want to focus in on the product. I also think just knowing like where your brand mission comes in. Like I think your brand mission should influence your product strategy quite a bit, um, you know, but 
it's also a great recruiting tool, but maybe not so much of a, like a buyer conversion tool. So I think you just have to know when to apply it properly. I think, you know, buyers maybe are a little more self-centered at their own pain points and their own budgets and their own problems. It's like, what have you done for me lately? Whereas, you know, a strong brand mission might attract like a, a better talent pool to apply to your company or might attract better different types of investors. So I think it's just like knowing like when to apply your brand mission, your purpose. Also, there were, I remember Mark Ritson writing about that uh, advertising study by Peter Field measuring, this was marketing campaigns, brand focused uh, marketing campaigns versus, you know, not. And, and brand campaigns did considerably worse. Um, it's definitely a fit if it's, you know, if it fits the brand, like, like, you know, Patagonia was came up, right? But if you're a B2B SaaS business, like it feels, it, there could be a fit, but it feels like an artificial glow, right? And then people I yeah. think will so, see through the bullshit. Yeah, it often mm -hmm. feels bullshitty, but yeah. All right, uh, uh, audience question here. How can one navigate being the first product marketing hire at a company? Yeah. All of mine actually has a 30, 60, 90 day like blog post that without planning to has been like our most popular one, but I would really outline, you know, there's a checklist in that blog post, but I would outline, you know, some goals for yourself and, and figure those out with your manager. So that, like, we're all clear, like what good looks like. I would really try to understand your job description. Um, there can be like a lot of nuance in job descriptions that maybe, or just like, un, they are kind of spoken expectations, but not super clearly spoken expectations. Um, and, and so really getting clear on that. And like, if you're a junior product marketer, you know, please don't show up thinking that you're gonna just like rip out all the positioning and messaging, you know, that the leadership team, you know, who's much older and more experienced has been working on trying to make yourself useful. I always try to like find like a small rock and a big rock. So like, you know, what's a quick win I can do? Okay, there's a conference coming up in three weeks. Like how can I just like tighten some things up, make things smoother, make some my teammates lives easier. And then, you know, you don't want to be in like a totally reactive world where you're only ever doing small stuff. But yeah, identify a big rock and a couple of small rocks. But what I don't, what I don't recommend doing is like trying to tackle like really nitty gritty juicy stuff like positioning messaging pricing when you really don't have like a flavor of the company unless you were more senior and that was specifically what you were brought in to do mm -hmm. yeah and if you're a product marketer odds are people like different people at the company don't even know what your job is like what does it mean to be a product marketer mm -hmm. so i would say the number one thing you should be is building relationships right product marketing is such a cross-functional role build relationships start educating pe people on like working on, you know, what you're, you're setting out to do uh, and just building that, that trust. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah asked a, good, a question that you guys might know something about. What can you do if you're interested in a career in PMM consulting? Mm. Yeah. Oh, Sarah was at Meta too. Um, I would definitely write some blog posts. Um, I, I wrote a piece for intercom like a long time ago because i had to it wasn't like something i was necessarily that excited about um and it like it kind of popped it went well and then my first consulting clients were kind of landed from that they're like hey i read your blog post like are you available um so i i think like you know sharing content on social and blog posts can can kind of help you start shaping how you know your philosophy and how you think and like how you might work with those people um yeah that's probably the easiest thing you can do if especially if you're at a big company like in-house like meta yeah and right, i think i mean if you're, sorry go ahead oh no i was just gonna say if you're trying to get into like pmm consulting even from the work you've done in-house what are some key projects you've let we accomplish um you know, start pitching companies on some consulting work like how how do you want to think about talking about the work you've done and what the, the kind of expertise you've developed i think uh, consulting is uh is a business of expertise right and how do people know that you have any you have to show it demonstrate it on a consistent basis and so it's 
the best way is to just do a lot of content marketing, write articles, active on social, run a newsletter, do a podcast, you know, put yourself out there. Uh, nothing will work on day one, but one year of doing this on a regular basis, people will want to give you money, you know, and much sooner than that, but you know, yeah. have a long term perspective. And I'll make one note on that because I had someone reach and reach out to me recently being like, Hey, do you know of any work I can do? This person has like 20 plus thousand followers on LinkedIn. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. if you have that many followers on LinkedIn, like you shouldn't need to come to me to figure out how to eat. Like maybe you're posting, you know, about the wrong content or to the wrong audience, or you're focused on like kind of vanity metrics. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I would say like much better to have like a thousand true fans than like 20,000 unengaged followers. Um, so yeah, I would say like, look care, like, you know, it doesn't have to be high quantity basically. Mm. Like you can do a few quality things and get noticed pretty easily. Well, okay. Well, I think that's a wrap. Uh, yeah. thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, Pat. Thank you everybody who chimed in. Uh, uh, lovely seeing you. You know where to find us. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.